Welcome back to Van's Reading. Yes, I am back. Sorry for the last video. Last video was terrible, but at least I went, I got through it. So we're going to start with chapter 11, Anchors. Anchors, all right? Uh, as we say, we know what the book is. Thinking fast and slow. Okay, chapter 11, Anchors. Amos and I once rigged the Wheel of Fortune. It was marked from 0 to 100, but we had... It built so that it would stop only at 10 or 65. We recruited students of the University of Oregon and participants in our experiment. One of us would stand in front of a small group, spin the wheel, and ask them to write down the number on which the wheel stopped, which of course was either 10 or 65. We then asked them, to, them two questions. Is the percentage of African nations among UN members larger or smaller than the number you just wrote? What is your best guess of the percentage of African nations in the UN? Uh, I think maybe what, 30%? Uh, the spin of the wheel, spin the wheel of fortune, even one that is not rigged, cannot possibly yield useful information about anything and, and the participants in our experiment should simply have ignored it, but they did not ignore it. The average estimates of those who saw 10 and 65 were 25% and 45% respectively. The phenomenon we were studying is so common and so important in the everyday world that you should know its name. It's an anchoring effect. It occurs when people consider a particular value for an unknown quantity, unknown quantity before estimating that quantity. I'm gonna repeat that. It occurs when people consider a particular value for an unknown quantity before estimating that quantity. What happens is one of the most reli reliable and robust results of experimental psychology, the estimates stay close to the number that people considered, hence, the image of an anchor. If you are asked whether Gandhi was more than 114 years old when he died, you will end up with a much higher estimate of his age at the death than you would if the anchor in question referred to death at 35. Interesting. That's actually a good point. I think that. So if you put the number, then the number will be the, the balance between. That's, uh, that's very interesting. If you consider how much you should pay for a house, you will be influenced by the asking price. The same house will appear more valuable if its listing price is high than if it's low. Even if you're determined to resist the influence of this number and so on, the list of anchoring effects is endless. Any number that you're asked to consider is pos is a, as a possible solution to an estimation problem will induce an anchoring effect. We were not the first to observe the effects of anchors, but our experiments was the first demonstration of its absurdity. People's judgments were influenced by an obviously uninformative number. There was no way to describe the anchoring effect of Wheel of Fortune as a reasonable... Uh, sorry, let me just repeat that. I don't know why I'm reading it so fast like that. There was no way to describe the anchoring effect of a Wheel of Fortune as reasonable. Amos and I published the experiment in our science paper, and it is one of the best known of the findings we reported there. There was only one trouble. Amos and I did not fully agree on the psychology of the anchoring effect. He supported one interpretation. I liked another. And we never found a way to settle the argument. The problem was finally solved decades later by the efforts of numerous investigators. It is now clear that Amos and I were both right. Two different mechanisms produce anchoring effects. One for each system. There is a form of anchoring that occurs in a deliberate process of just or adjustment. No, sorry. Uh, let me repeat that. There is a form of anchoring that occurs in a deliberate process of adjustment and an operation of system two. And there is an anchoring that occurs by a priming effect and an automatic manifestation of system one. Anchoring as adjustment. Amos liked the idea of an, an adjust and anchor heuristic as a strategy for estimating uncertain quantities. Start from an anchoring number, assess whether it's too high or too low and gradually adjust your estimate by mentally moving from the anchor. The adjustment typically ends prematurely because people stop when they are no longer certain that they should move farther. Decades after this, the describe uh, this game, ha, 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 there it goes again. Okay, decades after our disagreement and years after Amos' death, convincing evidence of such process was offered independently by two psychologists who had worked closely with Amos early in their careers. Aldous Shafir and from Gilovich together with their own students, Amos intel with their own students, Amos's intellectual grandchildren. To get the idea, take a sheet of paper and draw two half inch line going up, starting at the bottom of the page, okay, 
without a ruler and I'll take another sheet and start the top and draw a line going down until it's two half inch inches from the bottom. Compare the lines. There's a good chance that your first estimate of two and a half inches was shorter than the second. Okay, wait, I gotta do this. Let's test it out. Let's test it out. Uh, no, that's shitty paper, shitty paper. Give me a second, guys. Uh, here we go, we've got it. All right, back where we were. Oh boy, 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 boy. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. So, two and a half inch. Firstly, I don't know what two and a half inch is. I'm guessing what, six inches, 15 centimeters, 15 divided by six. So it's probably one inch. So, boy, so let's say 15 six inches okay well, let's say it's about a centimeter and a half i'm guessing so let's just pretend two inches three inches let's say so two and a half three okay so okay okay huh yeah he's right one's longer than the other cool all right next thing The reason is that you do not know exactly what such a line looks like. There is a range of uncertainty. You stop near the bottom of the region of an uncertainty when you start from the bottom of the page and near the top of the region when you start from the top. <laughs> For the gentlemen out there, chicks know shit about inches. Let me say that. Robin LeBeouf and Shafi found many examples of that mechanism in daily experience. Insufficient adjustment neatly explain why you are likely to drive too fast when you come off the highway onto city streets, especially if you're talking with someone as you drive. Insufficient adjustments is also a source of tension between exasperated parents and teenagers who enjoy loud music in the room. The Booth and Shafir note that a well-intentioned child who turns down exceptionally loud music to meet a parent's demand, that it be played at a reasonable volume and may fail to adjust sufficiently from a high anchor and may feel that genuine attempts at compromise are being overlooked. The driver and the child both deliberately adjust down and both fail to adjust enough. Now consider these questions. When did George Washington become president? What is the boiling temperature of water at the top of Mount Everest? It should be the same, I guess. Mount Everest boiling water should be low. What is boiling temperature? Maybe like above, so room temperature 25. What is it? I don't know. Uh, Probably like 30, 40 degrees, I guess, Celsius, I'm not sure. The first thing that happens when you consider each of these questions is that the anchor comes to your mind and you know both that it is wrong and the direction of the correct answer. You know immediately that George Washington became president after 1776. And you also know that the boiling temperature of water at the top of is lower than 100 degrees Celsius. You have to adjust in the appropriate direction by finding arguments to move away from the anchor. As in the case of lines, you are likely to stop when you're no longer sure you could go further at the near edge of the region of uncertainty. Nick Epley and Tom Gilovich found evidence an adjustment is a deliberate attempt to find reasons to move away from the anchor. People who are instructed to shake their head when they hear the anchor as if they rejected it move farther from the anchor and people who nod their head show an enhanced anchoring. Epley and Gilovich also confirmed that adjustment is an effortful operation. People adjust less to stay closer to the anchor when their mental resources are depleted, either because their memory is loaded with, with digits or because they are slightly drunk. Insufficient adjustment is a failure of weak or lazy system too. So we know that Amos was right for at least some cases of an anchoring which involved a deliberate system to adjustment in a, specific, in a specified direction from an anchor. Anchoring as a primary effect. When Amos and I de debated anchoring, I agreed that adjustment sometimes occurs, but I was uneasy. Adjustment is deliberate and conscious, uh, and conscious activity, but in most cases of anchoring, there is no corresponding subjective experience. Consider these two questions. Was Gandhi, was Gandhi more or less than 144 years old when he died? How old was when Gandhi died? 
Did you produce, I don't know, I don't know. I think maybe let's say what, 80, 70, maybe 80, I'm gonna say 80. Did you produce your estimate by adjusting down from 140? Probably not, but the absolutely high number still affected your estimate. My hunch was that anchoring in case of suggestion, this is the word we use when someone causes us to see, hear or feeling or feel something by merely bringing it to mind. For example, the question, do you now feel a slight numbness in your left leg always prompts a quite few people to report that their left leg does indeed feel a little strange. Amos was more conservative than I was about hunches and he correctly pointed out that appealing to suggestions did not help us understand anchoring because we did not know how to explain suggestion. I had to agree that he was right, but I never became enthusiastic about the idea of insufficient adjustment as the sole, as the sole cause of anchoring effects. We conducted many inconclusive experiments in an effort to understand anchoring, but we failed and eventually gave up the idea of writing more about it. The puzzle that defeated us is now solved because the concept of suggestion is no longer obs obscure. Suggestion is a priming effect which selectively evokes compatible evidence. You did not believe for a moment that Gandhi lived for 140 years, but your associated memory surely generated an impression of a very ancient person. System 1 understands sentences by trying to make them true, and the selective activation of compatible thoughts produces a family of systematic errors that make us gullible and prone to believe too strongly whatever we believe. We can now see why Amos and I did not realize that there were two types of anchoring. The research techniques and theoretical ideas we needed did not yet exist. They were developed much later by other people. A process that resembles suggestion is indeed at work in many situations. System 1 tries to best to construct a world in which the anchor is, a, is the true number. This is the one of the manifestations of associative coherence that I described in the first part of the book. The German psychologist Thomas Musweiler and Fritz Strack offered the most compelling demonstration of the role of associative coherence in anchoring. In one experiment, they ask an anchoring question about temperature. Is the annual mean temperature in Germany higher or lower than 20 degrees Celsius? Or is the annual mean temperature in Germany higher or lower than five degrees? Higher or lower? I would say higher than five, I would say higher than 20 degrees Celsius. All participants were then briefly shown words they were asked to identify. The researchers found that 68 degrees Fahrenheit made it easier to recognize summer summer words like sun and beach and 40 degrees fahrenheit facilitate, facilitated winter words like frost and sky the or frost and ski uh, the selective activation of a compatible memories explains anchoring the highs and the low numbers of act, uh, highs and the low number activate different sets of ideas in memory the estimates of annual temperature draw on these biased samples of ideas and are therefore biased as well in another elegant study in the same vein Participants were asked about the average price of German cars. A high anchor selectively primed the names of luxury brands, Mercedes, Audi, where the low anchor primed bands associated with mass market car, cars, Volkswagen. We saw earlier that any prime will tend to evoke information that is compatible with it. Suggestions and anchoring are both explained by the same automatic operation of System 1. Although I did not know how to prove it at the time, my, lunch about the, my hunch about the link between anchoring and suggestion turned out to be correct. I read hunch too fast, but it was lunch. The anchoring index. Many psychological phenomena can be demonstrated experimentally, but few can actually be measured. The effect of anchors is an exception. Anchoring can be measured and is an impressively, impressively large effect. Some visitors at the San Francisco Exploratorium were asked for the following two questions. Exploratorium, yeah, there you go. Is the height of the tallest redwood more or less than 1,200 feet? What is your best guess about the height of the tallest redwood? The high anchor in this experiment was 1,200 feet. For other participants, the first question referred to a low anchor of 180 feet. The difference between the two anchors was 1,020 feet. Mm -hmm. As expected, uh, the two groups produced very different mean estimates, 844 and 282. The difference between them was 562. The anchoring index is simply the ratio of the two differences. 562 divided by, 120, uh, by 1020 expressed as a percentage of 55%. The anchoring measure would be 100% for people who slavishly adopted the anchor and, as an estimate and zero for people who are able to ignore the anchor altogether. 
The value of 55% that was observed in this example is typical. Similar values have been observed in numerous other problems. The anchoring effect is not a laboratory curiosity. It can just be it can it can be just as strong. In the real world, in an experiment conducted some years ago, real estate agents were given an opportunity to assess the value of a house that was an actually <clears throat> that was actually on the market. They visited the house and studied a comprehensive booklet of information that included an asking price. Half the agents saw an asking price that was substantially higher than the listed price of the house. The other half saw an asking price that was substantially lower. Each agent gave her opinion about a reasonable buying price for the house and the lowest price at which she would agree to sell the house if she owned it. The agents were then asked about the factors that had affected their judgment. Remarkably, the asking price was not one of these factors. The agent took pride in the ability to ignore it. They insisted that the listing price had no effect on their responses, but they were wrong. The anchoring effect was 41% in 41%. Indeed, the professionals were almost as susceptible to the anchoring effect as business school students with no real estate experience, whose anchoring index was 48%. The only difference between the two groups was that the students conceded that they were influenced by the anchor while the professionals denied that influence. Powerful anchoring effects are found in the decisions that people make about money, such as when they choose how much to contribute to a cause. To demonstrate the effect, we told participants in the exploratorium study about the environmental da damage caused by oil tankers in the Pacific Ocean and asked about their willingness to make an annual contribution to save 50,000 offshore Pacific coasts seaboards for, uh, seabirds seaboards seaboards and seabirds <clears throat> from small offshore oil spills until uh, until ways are found to prevent spills or require tanker owners to pay for the operations the question requires intensity matching the respondents are asked in effect to find the dollar amount of a contribution that matches the intensity of their feeling about the flight of the seabirds some of the visitors were First, ask an anchoring question such as, would you be willing to pay $5 before the point-blank question of how much they would contribute? When no anchor was mentioned, the visitors of the Exploratorium, generally an environmentally sensitive crowd, said they were willing to pay $64 on average. When the anchoring amount was only $5, contribution averaged $20. When the anchor was a rather extravagant $400, extravagant $400, the willingness to pay rose to an average of $143. Yo, bring your prices up, people. That's people willing to pay anything. They don't give a fuck. The difference between the high anchor and the low anchor groups was $123. The anchoring effect was above 30%, indicating that increasing the initial request by 100%, no, sorry, by $100 brought return of $30 in average willingness to pay. Similar... <clears throat> or even larger anchoring effects have been obtained in numerous studies of estimates and of willingness to pay. For example, French residents of heavily polluted Marseilles region, or could be Marseilles, I don't know, I'm going to say Marseilles uh, for now, region were asked, that that asked what increase in, in living costs they would accept if they could live in a less polluted, re polluted region. The anchoring effect was over 50% in the study. Anchoring effects are easily observed in online trading, where the same item is often offered at different buy now prices. The estimate in fine art auctions is also an anchor that influences the first bid. There are situations in which anchoring appears reasonable. After all, it's not surprising that people who are asked difficult questions clutch at straws and the anchor is plausible straw is a plausible straw. If you know next to nothing about trees of California and ask about whether or whether a redwood and can be taller than 1,200 feet, you might infer that this number is not too far from the truth. Somebody who knows the true height thought up that question. So the anchor may be a valuable hint. However, a key finding of anchoring research is that anchors that are obviously random can be just as effective as potentially informative anchors. When we used a wheel of fortune to an anchor um, to anchor estimates of the proportion of African nations in the UN, anchoring index was 44%, while within the range of effects observed with, observed with anchors that could plausibly be taken as hints, anchor, anchoring effects of similar size have been observed in experiments in which the last few digits of the respondent's social security number was used as the anchor.
Example, for estimating the number of physicians in their city, the conclusion is clear. Anchors do not have the effect because people believe they are informative. Sorry, yeah, that's it. Anchors do not have the effect because people believe they are informative. The power of random anchors has been demonstrated in some unsettling ways. German judges with an average of more than 15 years of experience on the bench first read a description of a woman who had been caught shoplifting, then rolled a pair of dice that were loaded so every roll resulted in either three or a nine. As soon as the dice came to stop, the judges were asked whether they would sentence the woman to a term in prison. Greater or lesser in months. Then the number showing on the dice. Finally, the judges were instructed to specify the exact prison sentence they would give to the shoplifter. On average, those who had rolled a 9 said they would sentence her to 8 months. Those who rolled a 3 said they would sentence her to 5 months. The anchoring effect was 50%. So that's an interesting fact. That the fact is people decide on actually what is the the punishment. What, it doesn't matter what it is. Just what is the, the middle line. If that's the middle line, they will make their choices between and they don't care. They will choose it by based on feelings. So, oh, maybe I'll do it less like this. Or maybe I'll do it like this. And it has to be. So, yeah, remember, that makes sense. <clears throat> Uses and abuses of anchors. By now, you should be convinced that anchoring effects, sometimes due to priming, sometimes to insufficient adjustments, are everywhere. The psychological mechanisms that produce anchoring make us far more suggestible than most of us would want to be. And of course, there are quite a few people who are willing and able to exploit our gullibility. Anchoring effects explain why, for example, arbitrary rationing is an I think it's arbitrary arbitrary rationing is an effective marketing ploy. A few years ago, supermarket shoppers in Stow City, Iowa, encountered a sales promotion for Campbell's soup. Sorry, I think I said that wrong. So Soya City. So give me a second. Foods here. Foods here, guys. Just a second. This will probably be a minute or a two. I don't know. Enjoy the silence. So we're gonna freaking eat this food after I finish this chapter. Did you guys, hopefully you can skip to the part where you guys waited for me. Anyway, back to, uh, what was it? A few years ago, supermarket shoppers in Soyo City, Iowa. I don't know how to say this. I'll be embarrassed later about it. Encountered a sales promotion for Campbell soup at about 10% of the regular price. On some days, a sign on the shelf said limit of 12 person. On other days, the sign said no limit person. Shoppers purchased an average of seven cans when the limit was for, was in force. Twice as many as they bought when the limit was removed. Anchoring is not the sole explanation. Rationing also in play. In our, sorry, uh, let me repeat that. I got lost there. On some days, a sign on the shelf said limit of 12 person. On the other days, said no limit per person. Shops Shoppers purchased an average of seven cans when the limit was in force. Twice as many as they bought... When the limit was removed anchoring is not the sole explanation rationing also implies that the goods are flying off the shelves and shoppers should feel some urgency about stocking up but we also know that the mention of 12 cans 
as a possible purchase would produce anchoring even if the numbers were produced by a roulette wheel. We see the same strategy at work in the negotiation of the price of, of a home. When the seller makes the first move by setting the list price, as in many other games, moving first is an advantage in single issue negotiations. For example, when price is the only issue to be settled between a buyer and a seller, uh, as you may have experienced when negotiating for the first time in a bazaar, the, the initial, or bazaar, I don't know how to say it, in a bazaar, the initial anchor has a powerful effect. My advice to students when I taught negotiations was that if you think the other side has made an outrageous proposal, you should not come back with an equally outrageous counteroffer, creating a gap that will be difficult to bridge in further negotiations. Instead, you should make a scene, storm out or threaten to do so and make it clear to yourself as well as to the other side that you will not continue the negotiation with that number on the table. The psychologists Adam Galinsky and Thomas Musweiler propose more subtly, more subtle ways to resist the anchoring effect in negotiations. They instructed negotiators to focus their attention and search their memory for arguments against the anchor. The instructions to activate System Two was successful. So they said, so they said they instructed negotiators to focus their attention and search their memory for arguments against the anchor. The instruction to activate system two was successful. For example, the anchoring effect is reduced or eliminated when the second mover focuses attention on the minimal offer that the opponent would accept or on the cost to the opponent of failing to reach an agreement. In general strategy of deliberately thinking the opposite may be a good defense against anchoring effects because it negates the biased recruitment of thoughts that produce these effects. Finally, Try your hand at working out the effect of anchoring on a problem of public policy. The size of damages in personal injury cases. These awards are sometimes very large. Businesses that are frequent targets of such lawsuits, such as hospitals and chemical companies, have lobbied to set a cap on the awards. Before you read this chapter, you might have thought that capping awards is certainly good for potential defendants. But now you should not be so sure. Consider the effect of capping awards at $1 million. That this rule would eliminate all large awards, but the anchor would also pull up the size of many awards and that would otherwise be much more smaller. It would almost certainly benefit serious offenders and large firms much more than small ones. Yeah, that's true. Anchoring and the two systems. <sighs> the effects of random anchors have much to tell us about the relationship uh, between system one and system two. Anchoring effects have always been studied in tasks of judgment and choice that are ultimately completed by System 2. However, System 2 works on data that is retrieved from memory. In an automatic and involuntary operations of System 1, System 2 is therefore susceptible to biasing influence of anchors that makes some information easier to retrieve. Furthermore, System 2 has no control over the effect and no knowledge of it. The participants who have been exposed to random or absurd anchors such as Gandhi's death at age 144 confidently deny that this obviously useless information could have in, could have influenced the estimate and they are wrong. Uh, we saw in the discussion of the law of small numbers that a message, unless it is immediately rejected as a lie, will have the same effect on the associative system regardless of its reliability. The gist of the message is the story which is based on whatever information is available, even if the quantity of the information is slight and its quality is poor. What you see is, is all there is. When you read a story about the heroic rescue of a wounded mountain climber, its effect on your associated memory is much the same if it is a news report on the synopsis of a film. Anchoring results from the associative activation. Whether the story is true or believable matters little, if, it at all, if at all. The powerful effect of random anchors is an extreme case of this phenomenon because a random anchor obviously provides no information at all. Earlier, earlier I discussed the bewildering variety of priming effects in which your thoughts and behavior may be influenced by stimuli, to which you pay no attention at all. And even by stimuli, of which you are completely unaware, the main moral of primary research is that our thoughts and our behaviors are influenced much more than we know or want by the environment of the moment.
Oh, that's good. Environment of the moment. I love that. That is really good. And much so let me repeat that sentence. That's actually a good uh, sentence. Uh, the main moral of primary research is that our thoughts and our and our behavior are influenced much more than we know or want by the environment of the moment. Many people find the priming results unbelievable because they do not correspond to subjective experience. Many others find the results upsetting because they threaten the subjective sense of the agency and the autonomy. If the content of a screensaver on an irrelevant computer can affect your willingness to help strangers without your being aware of it, how free are you? Anchoring effects are threatening in similar way. You are sorry, in a similar way, not in a similar way, sorry, my mind's reading fast. You are always aware of the anchor and even paying attention to it, but you do not know how it guides and constrains your thinking because you cannot imagine how you would have thought if the anchor had been different or absent. However, you should assume that any number that is on the table has had an anchoring effect on you. And if the stakes are high, you should mobilize yourself, your system to, to combat the effect. So find whatever's wrong with that answer and don't, like you should try and find and analyze. I really like that main point is that the main moral of primary research is that our thoughts and our behavior are influenced much more than we know or want by the environment of the moment. That, my friends, is the fucking truth. Speaking of anchors, the firm we want to acquire sends us their business plan with the revenue they expect. We shouldn't let that number influence our thinking. Set it aside. Plans are best case scenarios. Let us... Let's avoid anchoring on plans when we forecast actual outcomes. Thinking about ways the plan could go wrong is one way to do it. Our aim in the negotiation is to get them anchored on this number. Let's make it clear that is their proposal the negotiations sorry, let's make it clear that if that is their proposal, the negotiations are over. We do not want to start there. Ah, oh, okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, I dig it. The defendant's lawyer put in a frivolous reference in which they mentioned a ridiculously low amount of damages and they got the judges they got the judge anchored on it so there you go guys chapter 11 i think we all understood what anchoring does to us all and the fact is that the environment of the moment manipulates us no matter what we do it manipulates our thoughts and our behavior and that's the fucking fact, man. Whatever, like in life, in internet, on social media, in whatever you see in life, that is the truth. We cannot, everything we've done is influenced. Our food, our thinking, our drinking, our partying, our whatever, it's all have been influenced by this environment that we all live in. And that's an interesting point. And uh, yeah, that's pretty deep. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, please put your comments and your, you know, your thoughts in the comment section. Like and subscribe. You know the deal. And uh, see you in the next chapter. Cheers. Bye.